Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever in the world you're joining us from. And welcome to this special web panel from Seeking Delphi, the dawn of super longevity, scenarios for a post-aging future. My name is Mark Sackler. I'm a member of the Association of Professional Futurists, and I'm the host of the Seeking Delphi podcast. Just a few moments, I'll be introducing our panelists or having them introduce themselves, giving a minute or two. Uh, this is being recorded for the Seeking Delphi podcast. Uh, just a quick overview of what we'll be discussing and why. In the last year, I was able to attend two very interesting and engaging conferences on the science of ending aging. Uh, those were the Undoing Aging Conference in Berlin, Germany, co-sponsored by SENS Research Foundation and Forever Healthy Foundation, and the Ending Age-Related Diseases Foundation uh, uh, Conference in New York, sponsored by the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation. And while the very hard science is indeed very intriguing, as a futurist, I'm interested in what the implications are. What do the future scenarios where this occurs look like and what are some of the issues right now that we need to address to get there so in that respect we'll have three parts to this program the first will be a half hour or so devoted to the current issues that we face how do we deal with what aubrey calls the pro-aging trance attitudes that aging is good misconceptions about ending aging and of course creating the demand that will also provide enough funding. The second half hour then we'll talk at some of the big overarching issues of what it might look like when we get there. Now we could easily talk for a half an hour just to list all the issues. I have here two and a half pages that I of questions that I that I wrote on one occasion in 10 minutes just before attending uh, the X Prize longevity uh, impact road, roadmap in Culver City, California. Uh, earlier last year. Uh, we're only going to deal with three or four of the largest issues and get the discussion going. So without further ado, let's uh, have the panelists introduce themselves. And we'll start right here nearby in, um, uh, to me uh, in New York. I'm speaking from Woodbridge, Connecticut, oh, going over to Keith Comito in the Life Extension uh, Advocacy Foundation in New York. Uh, Keith will be my co-moderator. Keith. Sure. Uh, as some of you probably know already, I'm the president of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, or LEAF, which uh, through its initiatives like our news platform and crowdfunding site, Lifespan.io, raised both funds and awareness uh, aimed for research uh, with the goal of extending healthy human lifespan. Uh, originally, my background is in mathematics and computer programming, but uh, like Aubrey, I've chosen to focus on age-related diseases as I've come to believe it's the biggest problem we can work on and solve as a society. Uh, over the last few years, just as a quick example at LEAF, uh, I've helped raise uh, about $400,000 for credible research projects, uh, helped to engage uh, millions of the broader public with initiatives like working with YouTube celebrities to make videos like with the channel uh, Courts Kazakht. And as Mark mentioned, uh, we started hosting the largest annual uh, New York City conference for longevity researchers, investors, and the public. Uh, this year, happening in uh, Mount Sinai Medical School, actually, on August 20 and 21st. We're in the middle of spinning up the plans for that. So uh, I hope all you know the viewers uh, come join us in the fight uh, to end the diseases of aging. Uh, thank you, Keith. Now let's go out to the Pacific Northwest and to the CEO of BioViva Sciences, Elizabeth Parrish. Liz, you're on. Muted. I'm, I'm, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Liz Parrish and I'm the CEO of BioViva. We're a company committed to uh, treating biological aging with gene therapy. So we do both bioinformatics uh, here in the States. We do uh, research and development at Rutgers University. We're developing a new vector delivery method that can deliver multiple genes to each cell at one time. And then we are uh, actually uh, partnered with a company that does medical tourism to get gene therapies uh, to patients now who need them so that we can get the first human data on how these technologies work in humans, which we think is, is the biggest step that we need to make today. 
Thank you. So um, now let's move uh, down the West Coast a few hundred miles to San Francisco to a person who, um, if you don't mind my saying so, I consider to be both literally and figuratively perhaps the most visible person <laughs> in the world in the ending aging movement uh, from the SENS Foundation, Aubrey de Grey. Aubrey? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, so um, I am, as you say, the Chief Science Officer of SENS Research Foundation. We are based just a few miles south of San Francisco in Mountain View, California, in the middle of Silicon Valley. And um, we are a biomedical research charity, a 501c3, that is spearheading the development of therapies that will bring aging under comprehensive medical control. We've been around for just over 10 years now, and um, we perform our own research here in our facility, and we also uh, support research elsewhere. So very much like Liz has this um, work in Rutgers, we have a variety of institutes and university labs that we fund. And uh, we're still very small. We have a budget of only about $5 million per year, but our uh, impact is considerably greater than that, especially these days, because effectively our business model is to take projects through the valley of death, through to the point where they become fundable and where investors start to get interested in um, getting properly involved so that we can spin projects out as startup companies. And so my role personally goes a, a long way beyond the foundation itself. I spend a lot of my time just, you know, introducing founders to investors and, um, you know, getting out on stage and on camera, of course, and generally, yeah, um, getting the word out. And I'm delighted to be here doing that one more time. Great. And to round out our panel, let's move eight time zones to the east, to the London area, and author and futurist David Wood. It's my pleasure to be here, uh, joining a great set of uh, thinkers and doers. I run London Futurists, which is a meetup that roughly once a month has a gathering to discuss one or other potential radical scenario that how the world might change, how humanity might change in the next three to 40 years. And we have often discussed in there, sometimes with some of the panelists appearing as speakers, uh, the implications for the future of uh, longevity therapies, the rejuvenation biotechnology that we are poised to develop. My own backgrounds, I spent 25 years in high technology, in the industry that became the smartphone industry. Before that, it was the mobile computing industry. And uh, like Keith, I share an original love for mathematics. That was my first subject. And I also spent four more years studying philosophy of science, which may sound boring and not interesting to our subject, but I believe it's one of the things that's actually very important in today's world. Philosophy of science basically is how do you figure out what good science and what fake science, or what used to be called pseudoscience. And in this field of anti-aging, it's quite complicated. But it is utterly my conviction that there's a great deal of very good science, along with some uh, uh, stuff that is less reliable. And in order to win this battle for true health, we have to assert what is the true science and we have to get more people on board. Thank you, David. So to kick off the first part before I turn it over to Keith to moderate the, the first half hour or so of of issues on the, the present state, I'd like to uh, kick it off with a story and I apologize to you who have heard this before you uh, because I told it at the uh, XPRIZE Longevity Impact Roadmap. But um, I think it, it, it is indicative of some of the roadblocks that we face in getting to uh, super longevity and ending aging. Uh, several years ago, when I was working in a small company that made instrumentation uh, to conduct physical uh, science, uh, uh, physical chemistry assets uh, for the pharmaceutical industry, I was in a conversation with one of my coworkers. I talked about to him about my interest in the future and future technology. And when I got on the subject, and this was eight or nine years ago, so it was not nearly as advanced uh, as it was now, but I talked about the possibility of ending aging. And he immediately launched into a diatribe uh, 
which is quite indicative of uh, what Aubrey calls the pro-aging trance. Well, we don't have the resources, there's too much population. Uh, we have always aged, it's the natural order. Uh, we need old people to die and young people to come on and bring their innovation, blah, blah, blah. Well, I looked them straight in the eye and I said, then why are you wasting your time in the pharmaceutical industry? All he could do to react was go, huh? And I explained thusly, 80% of what we do, not just in the pharmaceutical industry, but in healthcare as a whole, is to manage and treat the diseases of aging. But we treat them after the fact. If you believe that aging is good, <laughs> that means, then why are you treating the diseases of aging when in fact what you ought to be doing is treating the underlying cause of the diseases of aging, which is aging itself. And, and that, I think, kind of in a, in a nutshell sums up uh, what the problem is with the pro-aging trance. And this was somebody who was a, a professional in the healthcare-related industry. So, so clearly, more and more people are getting on board, but there's still work to do. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Keith to uh, moderate this uh, first area of discussion. Keith, you're on. Sure. Well, uh, before, uh, as mentioned, before Mark takes us to the future in the later segment, uh, I think we want to spend the first segment here talking about uh, the issues of the present, some of which were uh, raised by uh, a friend in Mark's story. Uh, so I think uh, the way to do this is uh, I'm going to start off by asking a few specific questions kind of to each of you and then parlay that into a broader discussion. And then if we have time after that, we can have a few more uh, general questions. But uh, I think we can start with Aubrey. So, um, Aubrey, you've mentioned in the past uh, how you transitioned from your background studying in AI uh, to work on the biology of aging because you realized it was the most important thing, uh, assuming you still feel that way. Uh, how do you make that case now, both to yourself and to others, that this problem is indeed the most important and pressing one to work on amidst the backdrop of, you know, others such as climate change, income inequality, et cetera? How does societal aging fit into this broader equation? So, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, to amplify the backdrop that you just described, it wasn't really that I realized in my late 20s or around that time that um, aging was the most important problem. I had always felt and understood that it was by far the most important problem. So the only, the only reason I was ever working in AI in the first place was because I felt that the problem that AI seeks to solve, which is essentially the problem of work, the fact that people have to spend so much of their time doing stuff that they wouldn't do unless they were being paid for it. Um, you know, that problem is pretty big. Um, and I had discovered in my teens that I was a very good programmer. And so I thought, well, you know, I've got good talents here, I can make a difference. Whereas I had absolutely no reason to believe that I was a particularly talented biologist, and therefore, I thought, I'll leave that to the biologists. The thing that I had completely overlooked and only discovered in my late 20s was that biologists actually didn't think that way. I had totally assumed that everybody realized that aging was the number one problem. And so it was the discovery that that wasn't the case that led me to switch fields and feel that, you know, even though I had to start from scratch, I was, you know, I had a chance of making a difference just because so few other people were trying. Okay, so then to come to your question, why I believe that aging is the number one problem? Well, to me, it's a very straightforward calculation. It's just a matter of how much suffering is caused by a particular phenomenon. So, you know, if we look at the situation, you know, if we look at what, how most people evaluate what matters to them, that really comes down to what uh, they feel affects their quality of life. Um, which really is, you know, kind of almost synonymous with the definition of suffering versus non-suffering. And I think almost everybody would say that their health is the number one thing that they go after. And that's irrespective of how long ago they were born. So, you know, to me, it's already a given that there's no real argument about this. It's just that people don't like to think about it, so they sleep it under the carpet. And of course, I'm not in any way, um, you know, downplaying the importance of other problems. I still think the problem of work is a really bad problem. Um, and for sure, the problem of climate change is a really bad problem. You know, lots of suffering is going to be caused. But, you know, 
if you've got the choice between, <clears throat> you know, having to go to work or getting Alzheimer's, you know, or if you've got the choice between, you know, having to find somewhere further away from the coast to live, you know, that doesn't have hurricanes or whatever, or getting Alzheimer's, you know, which one are you going to choose? Um, of course, these days, and today we don't have that choice because everyone's going to get Alzheimer's or whatever, you know, if they don't get eaten by a tiger or hit by a truck in the meantime. Um, so, yeah, it seems like, you know, it's, it's kind of strange to me that anyone would even have any doubts about it. But, of course, the, um, the basis of those doubts is, as Mark has already alluded to, uh, just psychological need to put aging out of our mind. Yeah, I obviously agree, which is why I do the work that I do. Uh, I think it's also interesting to come at it from an angle that maybe these problems are, are not so separate uh, at all, uh, especially with you know the advances in AI and how it re might relate to biology or even just the mindset. Uh, does anyone, uh, you know, David, Liz, anybody maybe want to pick up that ball and talk about maybe those aspects? Well, I think that exp extending human lifespan gives us time to solve other problems. But I think that what Aubrey's saying and that what, what we can agree on is that we're working on this problem because we believe that this is the most, the biggest impact that we as people can make. Um, there are other people working on the climate and working towards uh, feeding the world, and we are not asking them to stop doing that. The, the, uh, the earth is very important <laughs> for our survival, and it is, it is also a top priority. So I, I don't think that we're creating a, a hierarchy, a Maslow's hierarchy of, of scientific needs that need to be, these, these things need to work in parallel. So all of us know someone who is uh, working on these other aspects of importance that we're talking about. So certainly if you're starving right now, food is important right now or else you die of that. So, you know, the world is vastly working towards um, getting uh, these problems solved and um, just us, these people on this call, and luckily many others, and many others are joining, uh, our top priority is human health, uh, so that we can enjoy and reap the benefits. But certainly, extending human lifespan gives us the time to solve those problems. And just like the industrialization of, of major countries, uh, that happened on the back of lifespan. Uh, when people live longer, they live long enough to work learn a position and, and industrialize a country. And now we can do even greater things with, with greater health span. Makes sense. David, do you think I'm really that, pleased uh, that Aubrey and uh, Liz and others are dedicating 100% of their focus onto this particular problem. But like you said, Keith, there are connections between the other problems that exist in the world and this one. For example, one of the reasons we might not get to uh, uh, rejuvenation of bio as if social problems uh, blow up and get much worse. So what we're seeing in Australia just now with the bushfires is horrific. Could this be the start of something much worse? Possibly. And so in my own work, uh, I, of course, I think the most important thing we can do to enhance physical health is to address aging as the root cause of multiple diseases. But I'm also glad that others are focusing on uh, making sure that we don't have runaway climate change. The book that uh, I'll be releasing later uh, this month looks at 15 goals, which I think society collectively should look at. And I'll just mention one more of these. It's not uh, to do with physical health, it's to do with mental health. There is a sense in which growing mental health is uh, becoming an absolutely horrendous problem. And more people are dying of suicide and depression than before. And it is linked with uh, the risk of a uh, physical ill health in multiple ways, one of which is, as we've said, in some sense, the opposition to rejuvenation biotechnology is irrational and illogical. And the more that we see people having mental problems, and I don't just mean the people who identify as having mental problems, but others who seem to be sane, but in fact, they've been driven by mad forces and you know, demons of one sort. So it's, I see it as very important that we improve mental resilience, emotional uh, maturity generally, and if more people can benefit from that, then we will see, I think, faster uh, solutions with uh, anti-aging and extended health span as well. 
And to David's point, you know, one of the really important things that we need to do is learn to treat each other better. There's something within our grasp right now with a, all of this social media and all of these things out there that people are becoming, I think, more interconnected than ever. You know, people have the ability to impact other people's lives mentally in a much stronger way. And I'm really not surprised, you know, whether people feel shamed or disputed or, um, you know, not validated in the world because of, of how they view social med media and their interactions. We really have to, as a species, learn to get along, put forward that good feeling, put forward, you know, the peace and will that we are, we're here to help each other, that we are not combating, that we are not um, in some race to prove something before someone else. It, it's, it's absolutely essential. And in almost every talk, I, I talk about that. That's something within our reach now. Just put your best self forward. You have to flex that muscle of caring and embracing uh, our species. If you want it to live a long time, embrace it, have compassion for it. I 100% uh, agree with that. And to piggyback a bit off of what uh, David was saying too, is that I think the anxiety and stress that's increasingly being felt by uh, people, especially uh, here in America right now with, um, you know, healthcare kind of in question is, you know, greatly untracked, but it is a massive socioeconomic strain that can be mitigated by working on the diseases of aging greatly. So I think that's super uh, important uh, point. But I want to pivot uh, to our next question. And this one will start off uh, by being directed to Liz. So given that the global population is aging rapidly and placing increasing strain on healthcare, as we just talked about, uh, you'd think that activism for uh, this kind of research would be coming from everyone equally too, but this isn't really the case with disparities between the young and the old and men and women. Why do you think this is? And what have you noticed in your own advocacy work about how to engage all members of society in this critically important work? Well, there's really some interesting data here. So 2020, this is the first year that people over the age of 65 well, there's more of them than people under the age of five, and that's on the entire planet. So uh, when we look at that in many countries, that, that already happened uh, quite a while ago, but we have less payers into the system than ever before. And vastly, they're coming from, from countries that are not the industrialized countries. And so this creates the, the really first big pressure of what's going to happen in the next 20 years as the people under five start to, you know, at, go towards the workforce and are not able to pay for the aging population. But if you're talking about advocacy of treating biological aging and treating disease, we already see it out there. We have really good indication that everybody is headed towards the right direction. They're just probably not up to date. So there are a lot of foundations um, and a lot, and most people uh, can agree that we want to cure heart disease that we want to cure cancer and that we want to cure Alzheimer's. And as a matter of fact, millions of dollars in donations go into these causes all the time. Now we live in a sick care system. So we treat people when they're sick. We don't treat them when they're healthy. We don't keep them from getting these diseases. We try to start treating symptoms of diseases. So, so now you're treating something way down the line. So you're treating the symptom of Alzheimer's, which is the symptom of aging. So if we can actually educate and show that the technology works, and how do you show that technology works? Well, you can, you can do it a few ways, but one thing is just having a model organism that you can show doesn't get a certain disease. We already have that naturally in nature. So we have things that are bigger than us, that live longer than us, that don't get some of the diseases that humans do. And we have things that are smaller than us, that live longer than us, that don't get some of the diseases that uh, humans do. So we have what's called proof of concept. And then you take organisms that have shorter lifespans, really short lifespans, so you can show some evidence of technology working on them in the lab, and you modify those organisms to live longer. And we've done that. So what we really need to do is get people up to date with the technology and there's two ways to do that there's the traditional way you get a lot of money behind it and everybody on this panel is hoping that people come out with a lot of money to solve this problem we would all appreciate it and uh you show that it works um you know other than that uh you're stuck with um 
you know, the, the slow route of, of medicine. So the, the traditional way is you get a drug out, you get it to uh, medical doctors, they give it to patients, and they show that it does something. Does it reduce the amount of LDL in the blood? Does it um, increase the cognitive ability in patients with Alzheimer's for, for some point longer? And when those technologies are adopted and they actually work, people adopt them en masse. So what I'm saying is people, when this technology shows evidence of working in humans, they're there's no problem there. People will uh, adopt it en masse. They will, they will see it as fact. The other way is to get people encouraged and what we have to do now in order to get the technology funded. And so you have to show in baby steps, what can we do? So in humans, can we move biomarkers that would be more similar to biomarkers of, of an organism that was in a more youthful state that had a projection of a percentage uh, greater uh, lifespan uh, compared to a similar aged uh, organism of the same species. So, you know, Right now, we're in the early stages of the technology, the proving that it works. So we can go, we already know that the, the world vastly agrees that these diseases need to be cured. If we can show some evidence that we can do that, I believe that that will break the bottleneck open and that this technology uh, will be soaring, uh, not only funded, but wildly adopted. I've spoken, um, at multiple religious uh, group meetings. I have spoken all over the world. I've met with a couple of presidents. I have, everybody likes the idea of this technology. They would like to see it work. Makes sense to me. I think Im implicit in what some of your, what you're saying is, is I think it will map, these sort of successes will sort of apply to everyone. I think, like you said, if there's a successful proof of proof of concept that's convincing and persuading to almost everyone, what maybe I'd like some of the other panelists to to dive into, if you have any personal experience with it, is that being said, uh, data does show that there's some disparities. Let's take men versus women, for example. Even though women are are typically, I think, like eighty percent the primary uh, healthcare decision makers in an American family. Um, unless the question is framed in a spe very specific way, um, there's less support for significant life extension amongst women than there is men. Does anyone have anything to say about uh, their thoughts on encountering that, on, on deal, you know, addressing that, that sort of thing? Maybe David. Oh, well, actually, let me step in for a second. Um, so yeah, I, I have certainly come across that, and I think we all can see it statistically. I have not yet really convinced myself that there's any more to it than the simple disparity between men and women with regard to education and technical matters, you know, in uh, IT and, and the hard sciences. I have never seen any attempt to, you know, factor that out and ask whether if you stratify for that kind of education, that kind of background, you still see this disparity between the sexes. That's a good point. Yeah, I know there's been some Jeff, studies. It might, oh. uh, it, it might hinge on how the question is posed and that uh, women are very interested in health. They may not be so interested in a longer lifespan, but uh, highlighting the way that more people can become, for example, super ages and uh, live long lives without having the diseases of uh, chronic diseases. I, I believe that's something that uh, people from all sexes will be equally interested in. And so it's a matter of finding the right uh, story, the right communication, the right message to appeal to whichever uh, set of goals are in different people's minds. Yeah. yeah for instance, if you ask people, uh, would you like to take an experimental technology that may extend your lifespan? Uh, many people across the board uh, would be uh, concerned about that unless they're in an end stage condition. But if you ask people if they would like to live a longer health span, um, I've never had anyone say no to that. And for, uh, for the record, as far as BioViva and our partner companies, uh, we actually probably have more women interested in extending healthy lifespan than men. And that might be because I'm a female CEO of a company and that might appeal to women. Uh, but certainly as far as pioneering technology in, in our partner company, although I know very little uh, about the patients over there, I do know that they are predominantly women and they're not necessarily doing things for aesthetics, they're doing things for health.
That makes sense. And I think the data actually bears that out in, I believe YouGov and um, the Pew Research Center have did a couple of polls related to this. And when the framing is more like what you just said, the differences between men and women start to disappear. So I think it's just an interesting note about, you know, framing really matters here. And I think that that's a good way to parlay it into the next question, which will be for David. Uh, in your book, The uh, Abolition of Aging, you review the factors that are holding back the public discussion of why to bring aging under medical control. Medical control. Among mm -hmm. other factors, you name the paralyzing effect of becoming aware of one's own mortality. Yet, as we've seen in the last couple of years, the uh, pro-longevity community is beginning to exponentiate and grow, which means that in some way, um, people are finding a way to cope with this unpleasant truth. What do you think is contributing to this? And are we at the turning of the tide here? Well, we're seeing some growth in the healthy longevity community, which is encouraging, but it's only a very early days as to what really is possible in my view. The paralyzing effect that you refer to is the same as we've already been discussing, that people don't like to think about death. It's a very frightening effect. This has got a name, it's the terror management theory, which was developed by a number of psychologists, did a whole bunch of uh, detailed research that shows that uh, when terrifying thoughts are being approached, people on the whole don't want to think about it and they may make, it may make them more irrational. But it's my observation that uh, people are usually a mix of two instincts in this. One instinct is, yeah, they would like health, of course, and the other instinct is, no, they wouldn't like to appear selfish and to take more than their fair share of society's opportunities. So there are the two sort of forces coexisting. And we just need to find a way to strengthen the force that would like more health and to diminish the force that they would irrationally oppose this. And part of it is what Liz has already mentioned, which is that people will be more likely to join a movement, a cause, a community, if they see people in that community who are, in some sense, like them. You know, the initial phase of building a, a movement often involves so-called early adopters or technology enthusiasts who don't care much what others think. They just make up their own minds that this is cool, this is correct, but they're so-called early majority, and here I'm referring to a very important uh, thesis, which is uh, by the technology marketer Jeffrey Moore in his book, Crossing the Chasm, which nearly every technology company looks at. He says that the reason most companies die and fail to move into the mainstream, uh, the chasm of death, is because they fail to adjust their marketing. They're still trying to market to the early adopters, emphasizing the really rational stuff, Whereas for that mainstream, you need to have more emphasis on this is a, a solution to a practical problem that's worrying you. And in by way, there are lots of other people like you here already. So let's build on that. Let's have this community have a variety of normal looking people or people that others can relate to. And then I think we're going to see this grow, not just a little bit that it's already grown, but much more. I agree with that. One thing that I think personally impacts the, I, the terror management ideas is um, an aspect of learned helplessness. For example, I think that I don't think people are too afraid to think about things that are unpleasant if they feel like there's something they can do about it. <laughs> but when it's hopeless, that's what makes it something that you don't even, don't even get my hopes up, right? So maybe uh, I see Mark has his hand raised. Maybe some of you want to talk about how much do you think that's a component or if there's anything else that's more, more of an issue. Well, um, Keith, what I wanted to say, and I'll, I'll tell another story here, I think a part of the problem sometimes and why the, the, pu the public is slow to catch on is uh, simply a lack of imagination. Um, back in the 80s, a, f a friend of mine, a longtime friend, was teaching a adult education night class at the local high school in applied creativity, and he twisted my arm to take the class, so I did. Uh, and in the very first class, uh, we were given an assignment. Our first homework assignment was write your own obituary. What do you see yourself doing, et cetera, et cetera, and how you write your life. And everybody there in this class was healthy, educated, affluent, and probably in the, mostly in their 30s and 40s, age-wise. And I was appalled by the fact that other than myself, virtually every one of them imagined themselves when they wrote this obituary dying in their 60s or 70s, even though in fact, healthy, 
educated, affluent people, even in the 80s at that age, probably were expected to live into their, into their 80s, where I, on the other hand, uh, imagine myself living to 110. And we'll, we'll discuss more of this, I think, <laughs> going forward. But, but it was imagine of, of, of being someone who looks forward and imagines that things today are not going to be the way, things in the future aren't always going to be the way they are today. Uh, not just with things like our information technology and our, our mechanical technology, but also our biotechnology in our lives. So lack of imagination is a problem and the, and, and the ability to actually imagine how things could be different. Absolutely. Liz? Oh, uh, yeah, I think that it's called cognitive dissonance is what I think is happening, is that we are sort of raised by a bunch of myths and then we have a hard time stepping out of those. So when you have such a strong belief system and then somebody comes along and tells you, about something new, even if it's completely factually based, you have the ability mentally to not want to accept that. So, so for instance, um, we are raised, you know, believing that, you know, dying of the, the diseases of aging is natural and it's probably a lucky thing to do because that means you didn't die of something else before you got there. But what if every time somebody gave you an immunization or antibiotics, they told you this is going to extend your, your lifespan? What if they told us that, you know, some 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago, people might have had a much more difficult time handling the, the consequence of, oh, you mean that I am not going to die of what would be inherently natural causes anymore? if I take this type of technology. And it's something that we really have failed to educate the public on is that they already are enhanced. They are, we're already a transhuman society, not by everybody's definition, but by my mental <laughs> definition. We have already adopted technology that vastly extends our natural lifespan. I might have died a long time ago, and most of my friends' kids would have never been born as they were, you know, you know taken out by cesarean, or they may or may not have been, right? So, um, you know, it's that sort of cognitive dissonance of the myths that we have built up and we continue to stack and believe that vastly is holding society back. Myths versus facts. Uh, even facts are hard to absorb and, and accept once your mind is, is stated strongly into an idealism. And I obviously everyone on this call is very flexible thinkers, but the rest of the world generally might not be. Um, hopefully huge percentages of them are. But I think that, again, if you, if you didn't pose the question of would you like to take this an antibiotic to unnaturally extend your lifespan because you're about to die of pneumonia, um, you know, we would, <laughs> we would live in a, a different world, but we don't do that for certain reasons. And, and so that's why I think that this technology will be wildly accepted and adopted if it's, you know, would you you know, would you take this and, and live a longer, healthier life, but vastly not when it's posed in a certain way, because we're literally fighting an upstream battle against the, the thinking of, of many people. Plus, there have been people here for hundreds of years before us who have sold ideas that have not worked. Absolutely. That's why uh, contextualizing this as part of the natural or the existing progression of medicine is so important. A, a toothbrush is a life extension device, right? If you think about it. Oh, that's good. Um, and uh, to parlay this into the next question on, you know, thoughts of, or thinking about a longer lifespan. Uh, Mark, I noticed that a few years ago, you graduated from the University of Houston with a certificate in foresight after a previous career in uh, marketing and broadcast journalism, stating you did this because 65 is the new 45. Uh, what helped you to develop this longevity positive mindset? And how important do you believe this concept of, you know, career retraining or second careers, etc., is to a well-functioning society? Well, that's interesting, Keith. I could probably take up a whole half, a half an hour just answering that. So I'll have to get, be, be very brief. Uh, my father 
was an electrical engineer. He was a science fiction buff. And at a very young age, he got me interested in science fiction, in the space program, and the future, and future technology. So I've always been thinking about that. But in the 1970s, I was uh, still only in my 20s, I read a book by a, uh, uh, a libertarian firebrand by the name of Jerome Tuchilli called Here Comes Immortality. And it was the first time I ever read anything formally suggesting that, that this was possible. And um, it wasn't so much about the science as it was about this, the scenarios uh, that I've been thinking about um, all my lifetime. And um, so I, I adopted the thinking of a futurist for a very young age, but but never got to addressing the formality of really formally becoming a, a futurist. And when I retired from my, uh, you know, day job, so to speak, I said, you know, I can't really, I can't really just play golf every day. I need to maintain meaning in my life. You know, retirement kills, so to speak, at least <laughs> in the current state of things, I needed a meaning. And the meaning for me was to become an advocate for more and better foresight and society. And this is uh, obviously I'm interested in a lot of issues, uh, not just longevity. This is just one of my prime ones. But this also talks about something that, uh, and this, you know, because we're, we're, we're down to the last minute or two for this subject that will allow us to segue into the next part of this program. And that is what happens to human meaning uh, in an extended uh, in extended lifespan. What happens to human meaning and purpose? We expect to live 60 to 100 years maybe here in the 21st century. And when, when that becomes 120, 150 indefinitely, we might have to find new ways to uh, to sustain meaning in our life. And um, I'm doing that even now because, uh, look, my father lived into his 90s and several uh, other people in, in my family, aunts, uncles, cousins uh, lived into their 90s. So I'm hoping that I do that, but I'm not going to do that just, just playing. Man, the body isn't holding up so well for golf anymore, but fortunately the mind still is. So, so that's, that's my point. And I don't know if anybody wants to elaborate on that, or if not, uh, I think uh, we're right about uh, 30 minutes here. We can, uh, we can get into the next, um, the next section of the program. Well, since we're, you know, butting up against it, as you said, Mark, uh, I can skip a few of the other questions, but I think the, the, as a natural segue uh, to the next section, I would like to, you know, directly ask uh, all the panelists here, um, what, how has this impacted your own life? We, you know, as advocates, we talk about a lot of, you know, what we want to see for the world in the future, et cetera. But this work that we're doing, how has it impacted your own life? and your own thinking for what you want your future in this world to be? What have you changed personally? And I think that'll be a natural segue, Mark, into your section. Outstanding. I've already gone. Who would like to go next on that? Everyone being shy. Um, uh, yeah, people ask me a lot about, you know, what do I do to allow myself to live longer and increase my chances of making the cut for the um, therapies that I'm working on? And of course, I'm a bad example because on the one hand, I happen to be just genetically very lucky or whatever. I, I, you know, I've had my biological age measured in various ways many times over the years and I always come out ridiculously young. I'm the kind of, you know, um, ghastly person who actually, you know, I can eat and drink what I like and nothing happens and I don't even need to exercise to speak of. Uh, but the other thing, of course, is that I have a very, um, you know, high stress lifestyle in the sense of, running all over the world all the time, getting lots of cosmic rays. Um, so I, I definitely don't get enough sleep. So if anything, I'm probably shortening my life with my lifestyle, but it doesn't feel that way. You know, for me, the um, energy that I derive from knowing that I'm making a significant contribution to the world's most important problem, you know, that is all I ever want, really. Liz? I, I think that, um, you know, was when we go back to the cognitive dissonance, you know, we right now, vastly people think that there's a value in dying, living a short period of time and getting out of the way. And Mark just showed us how there's a value in living, uh, repurposing oneself, doing many different uh, tasks and challenges and carrying that knowledge with you in a mind that is still cognitively able to uh, adjust to change and add value to the world. And so changing those value scenarios and this area certainly did that for me. 
uh, I was working in software entrepreneurship uh, before uh, 2011. In 2011 to 2012, I was asked to volunteer my time for the education of the advocacy for the use of stem cells because the area was vastly underfunded. I spent two years educating myself on that. And in 2013, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Um, I knew nothing about aging research. Um, I, with the two years of experience I had in regenerative medicine, I didn't understand when we were admitted to the hospital, which we had to stay there for you know about a week because you have to learn how to care for a person who is now insulin dependent. It's an autoimmune disorder. Um, I found out that these technologies were not translating to these children and that kids there were dying of diseases that in research had been cured. And um, so, I mean, I went looking for, for cures for kids and I actually ran into Aubrey's uh, SENS conference in 2013 in uh, Cambridge, UK. And it revolutionized and changed my life because I realized that the treatments that treat aging treat children and that we could humanely help a lot of people and expedite cures for kids. So it really changed my purpose in life uh, 100%. Every day uh, we struggle with my son's disease and every day I work diligently. It gives me meaning and purpose uh, to reach out to other families who are also struggling and people who need access to technology today. You know, we're a very risk adverse society. We have a certain way that we think that we need to develop technology for the future, but in fact, over 100,000 people will die today who would have been willing participants in creating a better future. So for me, um, this area changed everything. And, and you know, in 2015, in order to push the technology forward, I took two gene therapies to treat biological aging. Something in early 2013, I would have known nothing about, would have had no interest in whatsoever. Uh, it was actually being touched by seeing my son laying in a bed and realizing without science, he would be dead. Um, this has happened to many people with their grandparents, with their parents, with their friends and family. It is a terrible, terrible feeling. And through that, we can find purpose. You know, picture yourself. Picture yourself. You're born in a jar. And your jar has 80-some years of oxygen, depending on how you use that oxygen. Are you going to pick up a hammer and try to shatter that jar? If your child was born with nine years of oxygen, you sure as hell are going to do that. And you should be doing that for yourself and everyone else. And so there's, there's a vast amount of purpose here. And there is evidence that we can do this and not working towards that. We are an intelligent species. This is exactly where we need to be. This is where I find my purpose every day to show my son that I'm doing something to help him and help everyone else in the world at the same time. Absolutely. One thing that I noticed that uh, in what you just said, Liz, is that there was one word that was repeated a lot, which is a through line uh, through what Aubrey said as well, which is purpose. Uh, I think by being involved in this field personally for me, you know, when you when you awake to the potentials here, um, it really is a clarifier, right? You, you really decide that you want to spend your time on things that are not ephemeral, that the things that are going to matter which ironically I think is one of the things that people say should be quote unquote, the psychological benefit of having death on your back is like, Oh, I need this to tell me that I, I got to do something important. But I think it's important to realize that also the opening of possibility of, of a longer future can give you that same feeling of like, Oh, I need, I need to do things that matter for the world and see other people as, you know, repositories of this wealth of wonderful experience that could, uh, extend you know far into the future and is to be valued. So I think it can greatly increase a uh, compassionate mindset as well. Um, but I think unless someone I really wants something to uh, to add, other than that, I think Mark, you're you're chopping at the bit <laughs> to go into the next thing. Well, it's just a matter of time. But that really is a good uh, introduction to where we're going to go next, because I think the biggest single question, uh, and it's a question uh, as we as we move forward, as we start to uh, control more our even our own evolution with both extended longevity and transhumanism is how do we maintain 
meeting. So looking into the, our future scenario questions, I first want to throw out a quote that I have used on my blog from the late uh, Anglo-American writer Susan Ertz, who said, millions long for immortality who don't know what to do with themselves on a rainy Sunday afternoon. Obviously, those of us in this panel don't see it as, as a problem, but we are s so engaged. I, I, on, one of my other, on my other blog, I bill myself as not the most interesting man in the world, but having the most cluttered mind. I've had so many interests and so many more things that I haven't been interested, haven't got, had time to get interested in that it would give me. But um, I want to pose a question to David in thinking more in terms of the masses of humanity, perhaps people less economic opportunity, less education opportunity. You're a big advocate of both longevity and transhumanism. So what do you make of the Susan Ertz quote? How do we maintain meaning and engagement with a life if we live to 150 or 200 or indefinitely? And do you think that other transhuman enhancements beyond longevity can come into play? When I hear people saying that there will be no meaningful meaning in life without death, that if there's immortality, then life somehow becomes a lower caliber, um, I think that's a very infantile view of uh, humans. It reminds me of the view that used to be said that if people don't believe in God, they're bound to do bad things. You know, we only will be good people if we are somehow terrified to believe in a religion. Well, it turns out that lots of people have given up belief in religion and they're quite capable of living a good life with lots of meaning. And I believe it's entirely the same with uh, living a longer life. We don't need a vision of a short-term impending death to help us to be meaningful in our lives. If I look at young children, they bounce out of bed early in the morning to get on with whatever excites them, not because they're thinking that in 80 years time they may be dead, but because for the sake of life itself. However, there is an issue here. The issue is that most uh, science fiction, most Hollywood films that talk about uh, longer lives uh, portray this in a selfish light. They portray it as part of a dystopia. So if I look at the likes of Alt of Carbon, the Methuselahs in that science fiction series were uh, described as being really selfish, uh, uh, unfair people. It's the same with films such as Highlander or Death Becomes Us or Elysium and so on. Almost always there is a bad vision there about the future. So it is very much our responsibility as well as we talk about the science. We have to paint a better picture of what people will do in the longer term. And I can say, well, look at Netflix. You know, Netflix is a great way to spend your Sunday afternoon even if it's raining. Well, that's only the start. So what I've tried to do as well as writing the book Abolition of Aging, which you referred to earlier, I've taken the view that I need to uh, flesh out more of a richer story of the future. And so this is sustainable superabundance, a universal transhumanist invitation, which uh, highlights the many ways in which our lives could be richer, not just living longer, but that we will be able to explore arts of all sorts, sports of all sorts, the universe of all sorts, and then the highlighting the future journeys of humanity into outer space and into inner space. And so I think it's very much a uh, lack of imagination that causes people to say that if life uh, was indefinitely long, it would be, be meaningless. On the contrary, I believe there is much greater meaning, much greater fulfillment in this uh, transcendent future rather than uh, where we are today with our terrible limits imposed by the biology we have inherited. Well, uh... Amen. As far as the, the lack of uh, imagination, we're certainly in agreement on that as imagination being very important. Uh, would uh, Aubrey, Liz, or Keith, do you want to add anything to that, either, any of you? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on David's mention of fiction, because I think it's also worth noting that th these some of these myths um, that pertain to needing the uh, a very limited lifespan to give you ambition is also very pervasive. Uh, the classic example I can think of is the elves in the Lord of the Rings. You know, because they're two thousand years old or more, they they don't get a lot of stuff done, and it's the humans with their you know measly lifespans that they got the passion. And I, I think for reasons that we talked about earlier, that uh, this is this is a myth, and this is my own personal view. But what I think about this is is that the diseases of aging, uh, what they really are, 
are just restrictions. And like any other situation with restrictions, I think what would really happen is if you remove restrictions, people are just more free to become what they already really are. <laughs> you know, like if you are really lazy or whatever, if you have all your needs met, then you can be more lazy. If you have tons of ambition and you have your basic needs met, you can now fulfill your ambition immediately and passionately directly instead of slaving for the man for 30 years before you can or not being able to because you're suffering because you're ill. So I think that's, that's one way to hopefully dispel those sort of um, illusions, I think. Yeah, it was, it was not many years ago that somebody pointed out to me the amusing uh, fact that the, word, that the name Aubrey is derived from the name Oberon, who was, of course, the king of the elves in Shakespeare in the Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, uh, so I've always rather chuckled at that. But to come back to the point, I think, yeah, I mean, people often ask me, you know, why would I want to live a long time? Which, of course, first of all is, um, you know, like, when did you stop beating your wife? Because I don't think about that in the first place. Um, but uh, rather, I mean, even more strongly, I don't even think about what I might do in a hundred years from now. Um, and I think, you know, the idea that the only purpose of all of this is to give oneself a really long time to do other stuff is, is just like, it's one of these fictions that we constantly have to work to dispel in people's minds. Um, you know, if someone like myself, who uh, you know, I think I've got a respectable chance of living an awfully long time, if my psychology in terms of how I plan is relatively short term, you know, I'm thinking about what I'm going to be doing for the next decade and probably that's about it, then, you know, why should anybody else be thinking that death gives, you know, I, you know, I, I have yet to find anybody who can really explain to me how the, the statement that death gives meaning to life has any semantic content whatsoever. I, 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 I agree with everyone. And actually, I mean, we're making some assumptions here. Number one, we're judging our neighbors and shaming them for what they might do with extra time. Um, that's really up to them. Uh, if they really have nothing to do, I imagine they won't be very excited about living, but people still generally choose to live. But with genetic enhancement, which is my area, um, there may be, some people may be suffering the consequences of their own biology. So if they don't feel like they can do a great academic pursuit or if they're suffering from a great deal of obesity and they uh, don't feel like they can get physically active those are genetic limitations potentially on these people mental illness uh, schizophrenia uh, OCD these these uh, problems keep people from being able to live up to their fullest potential and have the desires that might be similar to yours uh, but again having your desires are not necessarily what we should wish on our neighbors uh, but with genetic uh, manipulation and enhancement we will be vastly able to change the state of depression the state of obesity the the state of uh, cognitive decline uh, and that will be able to open up the potential of the whole public uh, in order to, if they choose to adopt these technologies, in order to live uh, a life that feels more meaningful to them, uh, that feels more in line with what they would like to do. If I had the ability to have a high IQ, I would, I would love to have that. And I might be able to uh, adapt myself more to an academic setting. Uh, if I had the ability to have more empathy, I might be able to a, to adapt myself to a better advocacy and com in communication with other people that was more meaningful. If I had uh, sports genes uh, similar to uh, what is already prevalent in sports and even enhanced from there, I might decide to put into in the work to do a triathlon. And... Uh, those are not bad things. Those are all good things. Uh, so number one, we should, probably shouldn't choose what gives certain people value. But of course, we want to improve everybody's ability to participate in society and solve bigger problems. And I see genetic enhancement as the direct way to do that. 
Great, all good, good answers. Um, I'd like to move on now and, and Liz, the next question is gonna start with you to uh, what I see is um, uh, there are a lot of issues and I'm only going to uh, deal it on a broad overview and not get into the specific issues in terms of a transition to uh, a, a super longevity state. And I know it's the fervent hope of everyone on this panel that rejuvenation therapy becomes widely available and affordable to all of humanity, but there are any number of possible and even probable scenarios where at least at first, that's not the case. And of course, Liz, the regulatory issues of 200 different countries are part of that. You went to Colombia to get therapy that you couldn't have gotten in the US, but there's also, for example, profit motive from venture capitalists who want to move forward and get their return and don't want to wait for a mass cheap proliferation to get returns. And of course, the likelihood, again, at least at first, that there might be those who will forego treatment for religious or philosophical reasons. So I wonder if you've thought about any of these possible scenarios and, and how they might play out. Well, sure. If you look at the five regulated gene therapies in the world, they are a one-time treatment to a lifetime cure. That's pretty powerful technology, but they are outside of the uh, cost realm that almost anyone can afford. And so uh, this creates a huge problem. And this is one of the problems that our company is working on right now. So we have a partnership company that does medical tourism, some, uh, very similar to the process that I went through. And if one person takes a gene therapy, yeah, it's cost prohibitive. It's like building a supercomputer for one person. Just getting the gene therapy manufactured takes 16 weeks for one person. But if we were treating 10 people in one week, it would be significantly cheaper for each one of those persons. And if we were treating 100 people a week, where right now we have the capacity to treat over 500 people a month, um, we would have technology that then, mo then an average uh, US uh, person or someone in Europe could afford. And if we are treating a thousand people uh, a month, we're actually getting into the realm of where many, many people can afford this technology. So it's a technology that we can scale. Uh, but we don't see that through the regular uh, regulatory system because of the, the vast, huge costs of getting through and people wanting enormous amount of money uh, as repay for putting their money into what is a good idea and good technology. So, uh, you know, we need to vastly change that. We can do that two ways. By scale, we're treating the biggest unmet need on the planet. And by the way, just so everyone realizes that we are still treating childhood disease. Every gene candidate that we look at treats a childhood disease. Uh, but then outside of that, uh, we, we have historically only taken private investment. We don't take venture capital. Now, as we spin our uh, research and development from Rutgers out into uh, a subsidiary, it will be probably ravaged by a multitude of sources of uh, funding. So we have to have the mission within the company that of course we're looking at treating by scale, uh, biggest unmet needs. So one of the problems with the technology that came out today in gene therapy, they're orphan diseases, there's not large populations. So they look for enormous amount of monies to treat these conditions. Uh, the spinal muscular atrophy just uh, received an approval and the gene therapy is two to five million dollars and the the babies die within six weeks it, it's completely um it's com completely inhumane we we can do better than that and how we do better is we we treat a disease by scale that actually then creates well, once you treat by scale all of the gene therapies when you have the manufacturing capacity all of the gene therapies even for orphan diseases become affordable Okay, does, uh, in, in terms of the potential for the, um, the universal availability versus, versus a, a potentially a split society at first, does anybody else want to comment on that, uh, that issue? I just do want to say one thing about that. The idea that when these therapies come along, they will only be available to the rich is a really pervasive misconception. I would say it comes in uh, number two in the um, league table I, uh, in terms of how often it comes up uh, uh, and beaten only by the concern about where we put all the people. Um, and, you know, I think it's 
not surprising that this comes to people's minds because of course we do see today that high-tech expensive medicine especially for the conditions of late life um, is indeed limited by ability to pay not not only in the US but also in countries with socialized medicine so um, you know, it's a people just completely overlook the fact that the reason why these medicines are allowed to be limited by ability to pay is fundamentally that they don't work and therefore they are effectively money down the drain um you know large amounts of money spent just marginally postponing marginally increasing if anything the time that people stay alive in a poor state of health and that this just therefore is a completely inaccurate idea of a precedent for medicine for the elderly that does actually work and that will pay for itself incredibly quickly incredibly many times over such that it would be economically suicidal not to make these things available um in a subsidized manner and uh, as such you know it's there just isn't going to be this problem but one actually does have to think that through in order to see that today's high-tech medicine is not what we are talking about. David or uh, Keith, do you want to add anything to that? Keith? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to put a fine point on what Aubrey was just saying of, I think, you know, Liz was also talking about, you know, how things become cheaper when you do them at scale. And I think this relates to uh, how important it is when we have a discussion about, you know, at the governmental level, like making a societal decision to allocate resources and prioritize the development of this research and how not just in the health and well-being and mental health of everyone's society, how that also pays for itself, as Aubrey said, with financial dividends. Uh, I believe there was a paper in, I want to say, 2014 by Goldman, uh, Olashansky, and others that basically mapped out that in a very conservative view of what these therapies could do, like something like you know, slowing the onset of Alzheimer's, heart disease, and cancer by 20% or something like that would yield $142 billion per year in, I think, just American healthcare cost savings. So, uh, you know, and you contrast that with how right now, you know, there's like a $6 billion budget, budget on cancer research and maybe like $200 million that actually goes to the root causes of aging. So when you look at those numbers together, it, it just makes no sense. So I think there's a discussion here, maybe for another time, of how we should societally make a decision that it's a no-brainer to do this. <laughs> so actually, could I come in again for a moment there? Because Keith sure. has reminded me of something that I think we really need to emphasize strongly. So the initiative that Keith mentioned is actually, was actually kind of a, a later stage of an initiative that began more than a decade ago under the name The Longevity Dividend. Um, where um, some of the same people were involved. And uh, indeed, the case was made that even a very modest success in postponing the health problems of late life would have the most astronomical economic benefits. And the impact of that, despite the fact that it was pursued and, and spearheaded by very established, very respected and credentialed people, was more or less zero. So we have to ask ourselves why. And I am 100% certain that the reason was that the initiative only talked about the economic benefits that would accrue from success in postponing the health problems of late life. They did not talk about the probability of actually achieving that success with a reasonable investment of funds up front. And that is a problem that still persists. We are still, despite the progress that has occurred in the laboratories around the world and in the clinics around the world even, we are still at the point where the overwhelming majority of the credentialed and authoritative scientists in this field absolutely run away very fast when asked to say anything about the time frame within which they, there is some significant probability of making some you know, quantified amount of progress in this area. Now, one can understand that in the sense that scientists are, you know, they're not trained to do that. They are kind of trained not to talk about this and so on. And they very much understand that they have a responsibility not to get people's hopes up 
unduly, but at the same time, complete refusal to say anything at all leaves the decision makers of this world, the, the audience for initiatives like the longevity dividend, in the state where they believe the whole thing is still science fiction and the probability of success with a modest amount of investment is zero and they do the calculations. They say, well, you know, any number times zero is still zero, so it doesn't matter what the economic benefits of success would be. That is the thing that I feel we absolutely have to change. And I realized just recently that it was now 17 years ago at the very first Cambridge conference that I first started being rather aggressive about this. And I actually wrote a little paper associated with my short talk at that meeting called something like um, The Duty of Biogerontologists to Discuss Time Scales Publicly. And we're still there. It's possibly the single area of our crusade in which the least progress has been made. So what's going to cause the changes here? Will it be the demonstration of robust mouse rejuvenation that you've often spoken about, Aubrey, or maybe the success with uh, creatures a little bit closer to us than mice, the, the dog rejuvenation uh, initiative that Matt Caberlin and others with George Church's support is doing? If this is demonstrated, will people then uh, take it more seriously? It's a great question, David. And um, of course, we're only talking about maybe a dozen people in the world. You know, the very few senior authoritative gerontologists who, are, who, who do a bunch of, you know, um, media and general, you know, interaction with the general public. So a small number of people, and we're all good friends. We all understand each other's psychology and each other's um, vested interests and priorities pretty well. And this was what had led me to the view that we may be very close to that tipping point. Of what the, of, of the shift in the center of gravity of the um, public uh, uh, pronouncements of the authoritative members of this community. Because I believe that it's going to come when these people feel that they can do it safely, by which I mean when they can do it without having a, you know, a, 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 a show stopping impact on their next grant application. Remember, the reason why I'm out here being able to say all these things and have been doing so for a long time is because out of those dozen people who really determine public opinion on this, I am the only one who does not rely for my next piece of research on peer-reviewed grant applications to the government. And therefore, you know, I can tell it like it is. At some point, it is going to become impossible to torpedo a grant application by saying, oh, this applicant said this irresponsible thing to some journalist yesterday. And when that happens, people are going to start saying those things, and that is when everything's going to change. Do okay. We, um, community, if I'm, do we need to, David, you had one th extra thing you wanted to add? I, just, I, mean, I think this is a really important uh, part of the discussion. So my question again is really for Aubrey, but others may chip in, which is that do we need these uh, small number of people to commit to a date in which uh, longevity escape velocity might be reached? Or would it be sufficient for them to make a, a more modest uh, commitment to a time in which the health span could be boosted by, say, five years? Which is, after all, all that the longevity dividend arguments from uh, J.L. Shansky and Dana Goldman and others uh, talked about. They didn't talk about indefinite healthy expansion. They just said, look, even if we only manage 2.4 years, I think there'd be huge financial benefits. I think you're right, David. I think that uh, uh, the discussion of a relatively modest postponement of, of age-related ill health would be sufficient. The only thing that is that it has to have all the three key numbers. It has to have number one, the amount of extension we're talking about, number two, the time frame within which we're discussing it, and number three, the probability of success. If any of those numbers are not specified in the statements, then the statement is meaningless. I would just like to quickly add that I think David is, is strategically right there in that you can see how other movements have used similar tactics to move the dialogue forward, notably climate change, right? How, you know, instead of saying we're going to completely switch to all, uh, you know, renewable immediately, right? Like, okay, by 2030, we want this, but, you know, and that seems to have helped move the dialogue. So I think that's a, a point in tactical favor of what you were saying. Well, and, and I think that, you know, so when you're talking about the general public and you're talking about a movement that is from the public, the public in at large is not waiting 
exactly for some scientist whom they don't know talk about some technology that they don't understand saying what their average acceptance of time frame is they're waiting for human results and that's why we built the system that we built at bioviva to create medical tourism along with bioinformatics to find out what works today so anything is a guess unless you put it in a human and find out if it works so we've extended the the lifespan of model organisms over and over and over again um, we're doing a, an, an amazing job right that right now with that at Rutgers with our new vector. Th that's not the point. We don't want to, we don't need to extend the, the lifespan of a mouse any longer. We need to show that the biomarkers in a human point to longer health spans. And that I think is what the public is looking for. So again, we can just deconstruct this. We can go back and when your children are born and, and have their first infection, if you're, if you're against immunizations, uh, you probably shouldn't be, but if you immunize and, and use antibiotics, you know, you should probably be told right up front, you are now extending the, the lifespan of this organism. And if we had that sort of mindset, people would see that these are just natural processes and we wouldn't have to talk about, you know, so if our company fails to exist and, and you know, vastly some of this is, is based in 90% science, 10% biohacking, if these people fail to exist, we're back to an old luttered system of you can assume you might well might as well just put 30 years on it we're taking technology now that was reproducible in multiple labs and multiple organisms and in some case in human studies for specific disease and just you know reusing it for for treating aging this is the lowest hanging fruit this is what people need to see they need to see that this is going to work in humans the public isn't waiting for a, a, a researcher that we know really well to come out and tell them uh, some time frame that may or may not happen we need to show that we're working in humans now and that we are starting to get results that will then translate. These drugs after studies will still have to go through regulations to get to most people, and that's another 15 years. My dad has Parkinson's disease. He, was, he tried to get into a gene therapy study. He's 80 years old. The cutoff was 75 because they don't value his life anymore being quality enough. His quality and dallies don't fit into being able to get a gene therapy to extend his life, which is just what that technology does. If you can affect Parkinson's and help him live five years longer, they think that he's not worth that. Okay, okay. if um, I can um, interrupt here, Liz, because we're running sh a little short on time. We, yeah, we Liz, the, gotta... so I, I, I'm only cutting in because I have a hard stop at, in, in 12 minutes from now. So there's just one thing I wanted to say. Um, I, I just want to emphasize that I agree pretty much 100% with Liz. There's just one thing that I wanted to amplify about what I previously said that perhaps resolves why I don't think there's any disagreement here, which is absolutely the public do not pay close attention to the detailed pronouncements of scientists. But there is an intermediary here, the small number of really high profile opinion formats, the Oprah Winfrey's of this world. These people got where they are because they or their staff do pay close attention to the pronouncement of experts. And we sure as hell know that the general public pays attention to that. So yes, I absolutely believe that this is kind of a two-step um, advocacy process, but I still believe that those steps are very established and therefore that subtle differences in the public pronouncements of the small number of experts I was talking about will have the impact very, very rapidly that I was describing earlier. Yes, I agree that they're a very important part of, of changing mindsets and actually, you know, getting the government to, to back initiatives like aging as a disease and treating biological aging and more funding. I'm just saying, if you're looking for opening the floodgates to the technology, it's the use of the technology and it actually working, which is what we have to prove. Uh, that that makes those time frames small enough that people will see them. If somebody says five years, well, how's, how is that going to happen if we haven't used it in a human yet? You know, not going to happen. We got we to gotta expedite those results. 
Okay, um, because we're running short on time and there's some people that want to, I'm going to forego uh, further questions at least uh, so we can get some questions in before Aubrey leaves. And I know Nicholas is um, looking to, uh, to ask a question. He's been uh, chomping at the bit. So uh, uh, Nicholas, I'm going to um, unmute you and, um, uh, oh, I see you're good. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we heard a lot of times uh, Aubrey saying that uh, uh, in like three or five years from now, uh, there could be a change uh, in society in realizing that uh, it's just a matter of time to the rejuvenation therapist arrives. And uh, at the same time, uh, I uh, remember in, in the book and in aging, uh, I'll really say is that uh, after uh, uh, clinical trials, uh, phase two, uh, phase two clinical trials, uh, the uh, rejuvenation therapies or in, in fact any kind of medicine could be uh, allowed to the public uh, to use. Uh, so we have uh, in next June, uh, the phase two uh, clinical trial results uh, of visiting uh, in the Mayo Clinic, and they are testing senolytics, uh, and uh, it's a respected institution. So uh, maybe we have an uh, incredible chance uh, in next June to, um, to accelerate uh, the arriving of this new mood in uh, uh, global public opinion. Uh, so, uh, visiting is cheap, che uh, visiting is relatively safe because it's a natural product and will be tested uh, in phase two uh, human clinical trials. So, if the results are positive, like uh, if uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, uh, test the physiting in phase two and discover that it really uh, rejuvenates uh, people at least a little, at least a little. Uh, how we as a field uh, could use this amazing uh, result to accelerate uh, the arrival of this point that Aubrey uh, always says that uh, society will change uh, its perspective, uh, maybe we could um, uh, provide a protocol to people to, after phase two, uh, is have good, good results, uh, we could have a protocol to everybody use visiting uh, correctly, or we could organize a phase three human trial uh, uh, with crowdfunding, I don't know, but how we as a field I, I would, like to, uh, would like to ask this to Aubrey because uh, we have uh, a short time. But how, Aubrey, uh, uh, you think we could use uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, result if they are positive uh, regarding physicians to uh, accelerate uh, the arrival of this new mood? Well, um... I think it's a great question. Uh, I, I, I honest, I mean, I think really it's going to depend enormously on the detail, the, you know, just how successful the trial is, um, just how much people who were not involved in the trial are willing to be positive about it. You know, other experts, that's, that's always very decisive. However, in addition to the visiting trial, we also have, of course, phase two trials going on right now uh, courtesy of Unity um, Therapeutics, uh, looking at a pharmaceutical that they've been developing that was very successful last year in phase one. So even though, of course, that is not something that can be taken through to phase three by the general public because it's not a natural compound, nevertheless, it will add to the, I think, the strength of the argument, the persuasiveness of the idea that we must abandon our uh, pessimism and fatalism about, um, about this whole thing. 
But yes, I absolutely feel, you know, every step forward of this sort needs to be capitalized upon by all of us as leading advocates in this area and use as strongly as possible to motivate people to start abandoning their pessimism. Uh, yeah, I'd like to jump in on a few points of this too, is um, on the notion of galvanizing excitement that progress can be made, I think it's important for uh, us, and this is one of the things that Lifespan or you know, Leaf and Lifespan that IO does, is anytime such news is coming out, we try to really handshake it so that it can, as much as possible, get to those influencers that Aubrey was talking about. So for example, when... Uh, Greg Fahey's team, uh, you know, was a couple of months ago announced the uh, results uh, of moving back the epigenetic clock. You know, we uh, helped handshake him with uh, some very popular online news outlets and, you know, do news stories about that and positivity about what might be possible. Obviously, you know, you got to be careful with what you say, but I think it's very important to, to look for successes and to try to amplify them. On the other side of what you were saying, um, I think it's important to note that in our current era of you know technological advancement crowdfunding crowdsourcing is creating opportunities for very interesting things uh, along the lines of what you mentioned nicholas for example uh, i think if you look through um you know the history of, of of the medical literature you know you'll see that there's been a lot of low hanging fruit potential therapies that have sort of been dropped along the way because there's not really a traditional profit motive uh you know, something like, like, you know, fisetin uh, is something that jumps out at me is, you know, it's hard to patent a strawberry. Um, although I'm sure you could try to patent your special brew of it. But another example is um, uh, light therapy and how it might uh, affect uh, Alzheimer's disease, right? You'd have a hard time, you know, patenting a 40 hertz light bulb. Uh, and I think that's an area where crowdsourcing could really come into a play. And this is something that lifespan.io is actually going to be is looking into and working on the next couple of years, because you can imagine the effect. This is a hypothetical, but you could see what it would what what would happen if a crowdsourced clinical trial, in a sense, was organized where, you know, when people donate whatever amount, they get some kit, they get a protocol, they get a way to collect the data that's verifiable and would pass muster, you know, uh, in an IRB, right? Like, what, a sh what kind of shock waves would it send if through a crowdsourced trial, remediation of Alzheimer's disease was shown with something like light, light therapy? Not only would that be amazing for the thing itself, but what a message that would send like, you know, to the public that we don't have to sit on our hands and wait for the government or wait for private investors to throw tons of money at the latest Alzheimer drug that's not working. Maybe we can like stand up and do this as a society. So I think it's worth noting that there are maybe opportunities in that realm that if one of them ever works, it could be an incredible home run for just excitement and getting people to realize that, that we're in the game here, basically. Okay. That's uh, great. And um, oh. I guess, do, do, you, oh, do you have to uh, take off now, Aubrey or? Um, I've got until my phone rings. So okay. <laughs> All right. Liz, I think you had something to add and then maybe we'll uh, yeah, try and take one or really two more happy. questions. Yeah, I'm really happy about all the technology moving forward in this area, and I think that it is great. I think that this will get good information out to people and actionable information. And then on what Keith was saying, how nonprofits can help actually fund people accessing this technology, something like Fisetin is really inexpensive, and most people could do that. So getting a, uh, the information out there and the protocol out there is the most important and um, I'm glad that it, it has patenting issues. I think we need to get away from that sort of stockpiling patenting mentality in these areas. Uh, we're working with a, a nonprofit called Maximum Life Foundation, and they have funded 10 people to take uh, gene therapy for dementia. And that is amazing. So they're actually funding a study for us and they are starting to fund people to raise money uh, through the public to take gene therapies to treat aging to get some early study results. And so this is um, going to revolutionize how we do these technologies and uh, people are helping to fund other people to access even things like gene therapy that are quite cost prohibitive for most people. So we're really excited about that. So that's that's my two feelings. I think we need to promote everybody's technology and everybody's research in this area and that nonprofits hold a really uh, wonderful position in helping us uh, spearhead more results of this technology to get it to more people. 
do um, while we still have a couple of minutes and our panelists are still here, if anyone else has a, a question, now's the time to uh, to ask it. Uh, you can let me know of your interest via the the um, the chat, or um, I think there's a way to raise your hand. I'm not sure how to do that, but uh, do we have any other questions out there, or just uh, unmute yourself and talk? Okay, right. so if nobody has okay. a question. I would go ahead. Hi guys, hello from Singapore. Go um, ahead. I've got a question with regard to promotion. Um, in a way, right now, like most of the scientists that like have a name in the field are like, I would guess between fifty and sixty. Very good. And right, my phone is now. Call it. My ringing, so I've got to go. Thanks for everybody. Right, thank you, thank you, Aubrey. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead with your question. Um, like most of the scientists with a name are like between 50 and 60 and like earlier somebody was um, talking about maybe it needs like a moment like the um, regenerative energy moment um, in the longevity space, which is to some extent like really driven by young people. So I was wondering which group should we target right now? Should we like look at like people below 30 who say, okay, well, I want to live until 120 and put this vision in their head or should we look at like the people who are like 50, 60 who say, hey, I don't want to age anymore. Um, are there like any thoughts about, um, in a way, which population we should target more than another? Sure. Um, uh, uh, I could start off and then I'm sure others will have uh, more to comment. Um, obviously, the, the best answer is all of the above, right, as far as trying to hit everybody. But one thing that I would say is I think some – it's important to always keep our ears to the ground for what is animating the public in general – what other issues are animating the public and how there is a natural synergy perhaps to, to align with what we're trying to uh, move towards. So I'll give one example, right? In America right now, there's a vigorous debate going on about what the shape of healthcare should be. Uh, you know, sh uh, should universal healthcare be a thing, right? So I think there's a real opportunity you know, and there's all these movements and people protesting in the streets about it, right? And there's all this energy. So one of the things that I've personally kind of do, not really in my official nonprofit capacity, but sort of like through connections that I have and whispering in ears and such is, uh, you know, kind of making the case like say, hey, if, if we're, we're talking to someone who is a leader of a movement that is galvanizing a lot of people about universal health care, maybe we want to let them know that, well, because of the gray tsunami and the aging population, if you want government to shoulder the healthcare costs of society in this way, uh, whether we believe in it or not, I actually think it's a good idea, but that's personal. Well, if you want that plan, if to the points Liz was mentioning earlier, if society keeps graying and there are less young people paying into the system to shoulder the costs, you know, social security, Medicare, these systems will fall apart, right? So there's a really easy case to make to those movements to say, if you want this to work, this has to be a part of it. We really have to focus on preventative health care. You know, we really have to make not just health care a human right, which is a buzz phrase right now, health care as a human right. You could just drop the care, health as a human right, right? So I think there's a lot of opportunities now. And in this case, it happens to be galvanizing the under 30 crowd. But I think that's the, the broader point is that we should really keep our eyes open for things that are already happening that are like people who are on our side, but they just don't know it yet, <laughs> basically. David? Yeah, so to make this possible, so that when new people suddenly think, oh, maybe this is a thing, maybe it's important uh, that they should get involved. I think it's very important that we have what uh, LEAF has produced and what Forever Healthy has produced, which is reliable, uh, accessible, clear information about the state of play. And there's some of that's, of course, on the SENS website too and other places. So, uh, Max, you were asking who should we uh, reach out to? Keith's answer was everybody, uh, whoever they come. But whoever it is, they're going to need to connect to the community. And so we need better skills at uh, collaborating, enabling, and uh, giving them the information that they want. The other kind of people who are getting involved who weren't previously so much involved is private investors and VCs. Of course, there always has been some of this, but it's been difficult for VCs to really get involved because they've wanted shorter term results. And when we've offered them the possibility of investing, it's been too much of a long shot each individual case and too low a probability. And what's changed in the last couple of years is the growth of portfolios like Juvenescence, 
So what they do is they say, invest in us, and what we'll do is we'll spread your investment across a range of different options. And although each individually may have just a low probability of being successful, by the time it's aggregated up, then this is a more attractive uh, thing for investors to look at. So this is a way in which it is now possible for investors to be more confident that their investment has more chance overall of being successful. So we need to help people to collaborate with us and that involves putting systems in place such as Lifespan and I, I like what a, the Forever Healthy group has, is doing as well. They have just published, I think today, their fourth uh, full report on a potential rejuvenation solution. They look very carefully at all the upsides and downsides and make careful, non-commercially motivated uh, recommendations as to if you are this kind of person, this may be good for you. If you're this other kind of person with this metabolism issues, then maybe this isn't good for you. So by providing these systems, we can make it more credible that more people will come on board more quickly and multiply the momentum. And uh, to get to Max's question, I might, um, I might add that um, I'm 69 years old. And on Tuesday evening, I had dinner with uh, two friends in their 30s, Cameron Bloomer and Greg Grinberg, who are both very active uh, in this field and discuss just this issue. How, how do we engage uh, all ages and all, all individuals uh, in this process? And uh, we are continuing to meet on a regular basis to dis discuss strategies. Um, I think we're running low on time. I, if any I yeah, go ahead, Liz. Really you have quick. one thing to add? Go ahead. I think that the important part of getting two different groups involved in this technology is you have to realize that the aging group is the pioneer of the technology. This is the first old person's war who should come up to try new technology uh, that is more risky than people in the greatest need that are 100% likely to die. Uh, youthful people, we need to break the cognitive dissonance that you know somehow dying young adds value or having Alzheimer's adds value to your family and friends, which we show no evidence of that. Uh, because the reason that we'd want to touch both groups is not only that the younger people will get older, uh, it's because these technologies should be given younger and younger for the best net effect in any therapeutic. If you talk to any doctors, we have eight exclusive doctors uh, aligned with our company. They would all say that actually treating healthier patients with technology is going to have a better result than treating very sick patients. So knowing that, uh, we know that when we're looking at regenerative technology, this is technology that people will take long before they suffer the ravages of aging in the future. They'll take it much like a vaccine against biological aging. So in our company, we work the same way. We have older people working in our company that have that urgency that they would like to see this in their lifetime and want to participate in it. And we have younger people innovating uh, specific ideas. And uh, that I think that that is something that in the future we will all do hand in hand, but that's our roles socially now. Excellent, excellent. So um, we really even haven't gotten particularly into future scenarios. It might be that we'll need a, a future forum to do that. We've devoted almost everything to the, uh, to the current issues of, of getting to where we need to be. So I'm going to see, are there, are there any more questions out there before we wrap this up? Anybody? I don't see any, so I would very much like to thank David and Keith and Liz and Aubrey in abstention. I know we're going to have um, more of these discussions in the future, and I hope uh, to do this in person at a at least a full day conference where we can also talk about some of the um, at least the transitional issues in, in the future, if not not the long term. So I thank everybody for joining us. And um, be sure to listen to, to alert your friends to the Seeking Delphi podcast. Um, the Zoom video of this will, should be up on YouTube uh, within a day and the podcast uh, on the various uh, podcast outlines within the next two or three.